anybody else get nervous about RTL sign-off? I know I do. I have these nightmares about my RTL having some weird issue with clock domains or something, and then I'm on top of a clock tower and I can't seem to get down, and I try to lean over and see what time it is, but then it's a different time zone and I start to fall and then my sample chips come back and they're all broken into these little spiders and then my boss is mad because I caused a respin and I'm trying to wind the clock again with this big RTL key and ah gosh it's pretty scary. Hi I'm Amelia Dalton host of Chalk Talk. You know RTL sign off doesn't have to cause nightmares. My guest today is Pete Hardy from Cadence Design Systems, and we're going to talk about some very calming solutions that can help you have confidence in your RTL before you send it off. Then you can get some good sleep. <laughs> before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find out more information about Jasper Gold RTL Designer Sign-Off from Cadence Design Systems. Hi, Pete. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thanks for having me here. So more and more design teams are choosing RTL sign-off these days. But besides taking away a lot of the work, it also removes a lot of our ability to verify our design before manufacturing. Now, I understand Cadence has some solutions to help us with that problem. Yeah, that's correct. And the key to RTL designer verification is getting the designers to do as much verification as possible. So they're handing off better code to the verification engineers and also to the implementation engineers. And in order to get the designers to do that, you pretty much have to completely automate the verification you want them to do. And that's mm. what we're doing in the Jasper Gold RTL sign-off solution. Okay. So... What are we doing before RTL sign-off to make sure our design is really ready, Pete? Okay, so what designers are doing, the RTL designers are really designing IP blocks, often internal IP, mm -hmm. but they're designing them with reuse in mind. These, ah. I, these IP blocks need to be reused on multiple chips. Sure. And there are different implementation details that are associated with those chips. So I really have to start designing much more robust IP and check it at the RTL stage so that it, it can cope with more or less any way that uh, it might be implemented downstream. Okay. Now, RTL sign-off has been going on for several years now. What have people been doing up until this point? Yeah, it's been going a while, and there's a number of solutions out there. They really involve static rule-based checks, and that's incomplete. We can do a better job than that by introducing more formal functional checks. Ah. They've also been finding a lot of violations and debugging those manually. One of the biggest complaints we hear about the tools that are out there are they're noisy. Right. So there's a lot of violations that keep on recurring that I thought I dealt with and it keeps on cropping up. And we're also seeing that a lot of the checks are made too late in the flow. So really trying to move these checks at an earlier stage and catching more of the simpler bugs earlier is what we're trying to do. Gotcha. Okay, so let's dive in and look at Cadence's RTL sign-off solutions. Yeah, so uh, what we're trying to do with the Jasper Gold, and there's really two apps that are involved with this, Superlint and CDC. CDC stands for Clock Domain Crossing. So what we're trying to do is have the designers check all of the issues that they can find at a very early stage of their RTL IP design. And then there may be a need to recheck those as the chip is implemented. And that's really not where Jasper Gold shines. There's another tool set within Cadence that would be used at that point, and that's really the conformal tool set. Oh, okay. So if I'm checking the implementation issues in the gate level netlist or whatever in a particular implementation of the chip, use conformal. But if I'm trying to make sure that everything is correct by design for reusable IP, that's what the Jasper Gold solution is targeting. Okay. So the Jasper Lint stuff was first, right? Uh, tell me more about that. Yeah, Cadence has had Lint checks for a long, long time. There was something known as HAL, which comes with Cadence Simulation, which is HDL analysis and linting. So what linting is, is a set of basic checks that are done to check that the RTL code that's being written conforms to some basic standards. Mm, okay. Naming conventions, various other checks that are done, whether or not the kind of constructs I'm using will give me mismatches between simulation and synthesis. 
Those kind of checks, DFT checks, so design for test checks, right. got added to those in terms of, do I have a sufficient controllability and observability on all the points in my code? But those are all basically structural checks. And yeah. on top of that, using a true formal tool like Jasper Gold, we can derive a lot of property-based checks. So we can also look at things like arithmetic overflow, range overflow. We can generate live lock and deadlock checks for finite state machines, for example. And these all go beyond what was traditionally available in linting and gives you a much uh, more thorough check of the RTL that's being designed. Okay, so Pete, do you have any examples of customers who have used this to check their designs for RTL sign-off? Yeah, Arm was kind enough to give us an endorsement on this. And nice. what Arm is talking about is that they're improving RTL sign-off and shortening time to market because they can find the bugs earlier. And critical to this is they're reducing the late stage RTL changes. Ah, okay. This graph here, for example, you can see that on the RTL block that they used the solution on, the red columns here. And what we've got on the x-axis is basically the time in weeks. Okay. And the blue blocks are using the previous method, which was simulation based. And you can see there's a more or less Gaussian distribution of when I'm finding the bugs in, right. the, in the schedule. And what we've done using this solution is to shift that left. So ARM was able to find a lot of the bugs at an earlier stage, nice. as shown by these red bars in the graph. Okay, so signals crossing between clock domains is a big issue for a lot of people. Let's talk about that a bit. Right, yeah. So there's this condition called metastability, which means that if you're not observing the timing requirements for the flip-flops in your design, the flip-flop can go into an unknown state, which is a metastable state, where it's neither a one or a zero. And that usually takes some time, maybe a number of clock cycles to settle down. Yeah. And this happens a lot where you've got a lot of different clock frequencies in your design. Ah. So as you're moving signals from one clock domain to another, if you're not protecting those signals with a synchronizer to synchronize to the new clock, then this metastable effect will happen and it will cause functional problems in your design. Mm, okay. So it used to be that those problems would be sorted out at a later stage by making sure that synchronizers were in place and also confirming after synthesis that the timing paths were all correct. We're finding that's not good enough now. Mm -hmm. And what people really want to do is identify clock domain crossing problems earlier and right. make sure that they are synchronized well enough that it doesn't matter the timing details that happen later when I implement. It'll always work correctly. So that's what we're aiming with the CDC app at. Now, what does Jasper Gold do for me on the clock domain side of things? Okay, so traditional CDC tools do structural checks, which look for a correct synchronizer being in place for all of the signals that cross these clock domains. With true formal technology in Jasper Gold, we can do a lot better than that. And we also look for functional checks. Mm. There's a certain kind of synchronizer, which is a FIFO synchronizer. And it's easy to check that that FIFO synchronizer is in place. Yeah. It's less easy to check that I'm observing correct gray code communication across that FIFO synchronizer. Right. So to be able to check for that, that's a functional check rather than a structural check. Mm -hmm. And we create the properties automatically to make those kinds of checks. What we do beyond that is that the noise, which is the violations that I thought I dealt with and keep on cropping up, yeah. that, uh, we mentioned before, what we can also do is use the formal debug capabilities to make sure that we're properly handling the violations debugging those. We can do root cause analysis on a bunch of similar violations. And one thing we're particularly proud of in the CDC app is we have an auto waiver feature. Okay. What the auto waiver feature does, there's many cases with CDC where I have a potential violation and maybe it's a violation if a certain pseudo static signal doesn't remain static. So how do I answer that question? And what our auto waiver feature does is it identifies to the user this may or may not be a problem. Mm -hmm. And we also create a property that explores whether or not indeed, for the case I mentioned of a quasi-static signal, does that signal indeed remain static? Mm. And depending on whether that test passes, yeah. we can take the auto waiver and either promote it to a full waiver 
that violation does not matter in this design. We can flag it as a violation. We proved that this particular signal would not indeed remain static. We're very proud of that. It's very thorough and helpful technology. Cool. All right. So, Pete, can you walk me through the CDC process? Yeah. First step of that is configuration. And in terms of configuration, what we need to do is set up all the clocks and resets and the association of the various ports in the design to those clocks and resets. Okay. This is nothing more than we need to do for verification anyway. So this is not an extra step for CDC. This information is usually available. Sometimes this information is available in SDC, Synthesis mm -hmm. Design Constraints. And okay. where that information is available there, we can derive it from that as well. So it can be entered by script, it can be entered by reading the SDC, or it can be entered graphically by the user. Then we progress from that to structural analysis. What structural analysis does is it first identifies all the clock domain crossings that you have in your design. Okay. And then when you run the structural checks, we identify how many of those CDC pairs, as we call them, are indeed protected by synchronizers and which ones are flagged as not being protected by synchronizers. Okay. After you've got that, then the third stage is to run the functional checks. Okay. And those are the kind of checks I was talking about that look at the protocol. Are we obeying the gray code rules for the FIFO synchronizer, for example? And then a fourth step we can do, even with the best synchronizer schemes, you still get a metastability effect that can transfer through the synchronizer and produce glitches in your design. Mm. We sometimes want to investigate whether those glitches in the design create a problem. And that's called metastability modeling and injection. Okay. And we can model those metastability glitches. We can inject those at various points in the design. It's user controlled. And we can do that both informal. The formal tool will tell you if there's a functional problem. But we can also export those to simulation. Mm, so okay. it's a very tight integration with our Excelium simulator to be able to do that. Okay, so Pete, I'm all configured. That was the first step. Uh, let's walk through these structural checks a little more. Yeah, so the structural checks, just to recap, I'm looking at all the clock domain crossings and I'm trying to show which ones appear to have a valid synchronizer in place and which don't. Mm -hmm. And I'm also looking for things that can happen beyond the synchronizers. For example, do I have convergence paths or reconvergence paths where a signal from a different clock domain will converge some distance, some number of cycles into the design. Yeah. So we're not just looking at the input registers to a particular clock domain, but also looking beyond that to look at convergence checks. All right. And then you said functional protocol checks were next, right? Yeah, that's right. And, you know, a different view is often useful to look at that. And this is a more traditional formal verification view where you're looking at the properties that get created and you're looking at which properties are failing, which properties are passing, and right. then you're able to link those back to the source code and debug what's going on. And then metastability. Now, I've known some people that were a bit of metastable. <laughs> How does our verification help with metastability? metastability. Yeah. So what the synchronizers for the clock domain crossings are trying to do is eradicate the metastability issue. Okay. But they don't always do it perfectly. And sometimes I will get glitches. Mm. I can design synchronizers to totally eliminate glitches, but that becomes expensive. So there are situations where I want to find out whether or not the occasional glitch causes a functional problem in my design. Mm. And that's what the metastability injection in modeling and injection in both formal and simulation does for me. Okay, so what's the UI for all of this look like? Is there some kind of cockpit where I work? Yeah, indeed. All of the Jasper Gold apps run in the, in the Jasper Gold console, but the visualization techniques that we have for debugging varies depending on the app. And yeah. for Clock Domain Crossing, we've got some uh, nice innovative debug views. We are using a graph view, which basically highlights the registers in the design okay. and colors differently the registers that are in different clock domains. Gotcha. So it's very intuitive and I can see straight away where my clock domain crossings are. And then if I want a more detailed view, that's interactive with a full schematic view. So I can see, for instance, one common problem is I had a synchronizer, but some spurious circuitry got inserted in between the stages of the synchronizer. Yeah. That's usually a bad thing. So sometimes I need to see all of the logic that is present in between the registers. Yeah. But a lot of the time, I'm just looking at the registers and which clock domain they're in. And the graph view does that very nicely for us. Okay, so 
one issue I usually run into is tons of violations or errors that aren't important to me. Is there a way to clean that up so I can focus on the important stuff? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, the noise that we've seen that customers complain about for previous solutions, there's a couple of different ways that noise manifests itself. One way is that I have a whole bunch of very similar violations that yeah. have almost the same root cause, but right. they're not displayed that way. So I have to go and debug every one. So one thing we can do is group and filter violations very, very nicely. Hmm. So what that does is to help me look at groups of violations that seem to have the same cause. Then I can debug and eliminate that cause in one go. So do you have any customers using the CDC solution and is it working out there in the real design world? Yeah, absolutely. ST, ST Microelectronics, and this uh, part of ST is actually in Milan in Italy. Uh -huh. David Vincenzoni is a design manager at a group that's using our CDC app. And he has exactly the problem that we described, that he is providing IP that needs to be reused in a bunch of other ST chips. Right. So he wants to make sure that that IP is designed to be CDC correct. One of the things that he found was that by using our structural and also our functional checks, he found some functional errors. He could eliminate those bugs much earlier in the process and that increased the quality of his designs. And his reckoning was on each IP block, that would save in between two and four weeks. Wow. So, and they deal with quite a lot of IP blocks. So that's, sure. that's a lot of time saving if you look at it as, you know, a project wide. Absolutely. All right. Well, Pete, I think that's all I have time for today. Can you wrap up your main points for me real quick? Sure. So what we're really doing here, we're bringing best in class formal to the RTL designers desktop and, you know, checks that were previously performed on the netlist for a variety of reasons now need to be performed on the RTL. Mm -hmm. We're delivering that in two apps, the Jasper Gold Superlint and also the CDC apps. What these apps are doing are superior functional checks. They're lowering the noise, they're handling the violations, giving you the ability to work out which violations can be safely waived. And also we have a very good integration with our new Excelium parallel simulator. So we reckon, and the customer endorsements we talked about show that we can get sign off for RTL design IP up to four weeks earlier and reduce the late stage RTL changes by up to 80%. Excellent. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Pete. Thank you very much for having me. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find out even more information about Jasper Gold RTL designer sign off from Cadence Design Systems. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, check out the Chalk Talks section on eejournal.com or head on over to YouTube, keyword eejournal. <laughs>